got to buff it some. Yeah, I definitely got to buff out some of the scratches and whatnot. I don't really see any dents though, so... Yeah, the only dent is uh, my back right, uh, back passenger fender had a rock smash up into it, so that's the only issue with it went. You have a lot fewer dents than me anyway. How'd you get the one on your driver's side door? And also, why does uh, your license, license plate say Guam? Uh, I just transferred here from Guam a short time ago. I actually have the California plates in the truck. I re-registered it with California like a week ago. I just was too lazy to throw them on. And the um, thing where it looks like a baseball bat hit my driver door is from Gold Mountain. Ouch. Uh, I thought I was... I. It's a wide truck with one of the... Um, uh, ledges, I was kind of forced to go up in a weird spot. I thought I was going to clear the tree. I didn't. So I sanded it down a little and then threw a bunch of touch-up paint on it to keep the rust demons away. Just take the door off and just be like a Jeep. No, no, if I wanted a Jeep, I'd buy a Jeep. I actually like having doors that are a little more solid and So out of curiosity, what's the bill and what's the lead time to get a truck from Guam back to the States? Uh it kind of depends on when your truck gets to the port and when the uh, next shipping vessel is going to leave. It took about two and a half, three months for it to get to Guam. It only took six weeks to get back to the States. Uh, it's kind of a crapshoot, really. I think the supposed day amount of days is 45 but it really just kind of depends on port logistics on forces? yeah although it would be no different if you if either the navy was paying to ship it or if you just went through like Matson or some other shipping company my truck was any longer, I also would have had to pay some of the cost of shipping it. You chose wisely. I don't know, sometimes I wish I had the 8 foot bed. On the upside I have a one piece rear drive shaft. This is the only uh, wheelbase of Tundra that doesn't have to deal with that crap. Although I don't hear as many Tundra owners complain about having driveline vibration problems. mud and water on this trail than the other one. This is, this is nothing. There's big water pits. It's awesome.
So is there like a, a natural spring up here or is it just runoff? It's runoff, but there's also a, like a water filtration center here, something like that, at the very end. Maybe I'll make the next truck even bigger and dumber, like a F-350 chassis cab. Only if you put 22s and low profile tires on it. Nah, uh, you know, hey, you know, like, like, it's like all the Jeep owners that, like, spend all that money to put bigger axles on their trucks when they could have just got like a F-250 or a Ram 2500 and bought a truck with a big dumb V8 and big dumb axles. If I was going to get one of those, the uh, Ram truck is pretty damn impressive. If that's what you want. And it comes from the factory that way. Dana 44 or Dana 60 to push those big ass tires around anyways. Oh man, Power Wagons, it's got a 11 and a half inch axle in the rear and a big ol' 9 and a quarter in the front. Power Wagons not gonna be able to see the big one though. I think it could. You just gotta not worry about scratches. So I'm buying a $70,000 truck, I'm definitely not worried about scratches. Buy a Fiat. Made by the same company. Again, it's just every time I see like a poor little Tacoma or Jeep loaded with 2,000 pounds of shit, I, I kind of wonder why they didn't just buy an F-250 or something. A little bit cheaper though. Not really, not once you put a bunch of crap on it to upgrade it. You have to use the right tool for the right job, you're not going to use an F-250 go off-roading and, you know, camp for five, six, seven days in the middle of nowhere. I don't know. I feel like the F-250 would do better at it than, like, like a Tacoma with a rooftop tent weighed down with 2,000 pounds of stuff. Yeah, I don't think so. You don't go to Anza-Borrego or something like that, even Death Valley, and you don't see F-250s out four or five hundred miles from the middle of nowhere. I mean, it, not as commonly, but I feel like for what a lot of people who say they go overlanding do, it would make a lot more sense. Well, you can just pack light. I mean, that's the cheaper option, but then I need—I don't have my 1,500 pounds of overlanding gear with me. You don't need 1,500 pounds. Again, some of the builds I see on the forums make me wonder. Did you guys see the guy that said, I put on the cars and I bottomed them out? <sighs> that man needs an F-250. On YouTube, and the guys that uh, basically go out in the middle of nowhere for three weeks on end and do some real off-roading, like crazy shit stuff worse than what we did. Uh, those guys have rooftop tents and swags and pack a ton of gear, but you know, it's all purpose-built stuff. You're not going to see a full-size truck doing tight, super three-point turn, you know, trails. I don't know. 
know, I think you can. I mean, you know, it's what all the utilities companies use to access a lot of their remote stations. I make the I make my big dumb tundra fit. I just take some dents for it sometimes. I bogged out my cars, what do I do? They're frowning at me when I drive on the street. You can't put the cars on? No, no. That, I was making fun of that other guy. I, I have the stock leaf springs in the rear. I've got the uh, standard the cars on mine. I wonder what's on the other side. It seems really narrow at the top there. It can't be bad as you're and of course the motorbikes decide to go behind me. I still haven't reached the other side of the trail, or the spur. My uh, Google Maps is working, and it shows that that spur goes quite a ways before it meets back up with the main road. Fuck. I have nowhere to let these guys ahead of me. Thank you. 